Welcome to the Be What You Want podcast. My name is Chris Hall, and today I am so excited to have Dr. Teresa Bullard on the, on the line with me. Um, I came across Dr. Bullard's work um, through Gaia, um, which is one of the apps that you can download and watch wonderful content. Um, now, Dr. Teresa Bullard is a unique lady because what she does is she synthesizes mystery school teachings and ancient wisdom, and she brings it together with quantum physics and, and science. So I think that this is where things are going now. It used to be that mystery school teachings and ancient things of the past were you know, almost things of legend. And, but now what's happening in terms of our consciousness is we're getting to a place where we can bring together science and, and all of this together in one thing. So I'm genuinely fascinated to have a conversation with Teresa today. And um, before I go into it, let me give a little bit of an introduction. Um, so Dr. Bullard is a PhD physicist. She's an author, a teacher, a guide, and a master trainer in the Modern Mystery School. We'll put a link to that in the description below. Um, I told you where I came across Dr. Bullard. Um, but her passions are all about uniting science and spiritual wisdom in a practical way, drawing from these diverse fields so that we can apply universal principles towards a more powerful life personally. Um, so her goal is to indeed accelerate this progression and to activate the inner gifts that we all have, expand consciousness and create one's ultimate life. So Dr. Bullard, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I'm looking forward to this. You have to forgive me. I'm a speaker, so I tend to go off on a bit of a passionate rant. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> so look, you know, on this, on this, uh, this meeting point that we're now coming to, um, can I ask an opening question? You know, we've got ancient wisdom teachings, we've got legends, we've got myths, we've got all these things that, should we say, have been in the past um, up until now. And now we've got this new era of quantum physics, and there are certain areas that are beginning to overlap. Can you, can you just open us up with a bit of a overview on some of the overlaps that are now occurring that we can observe? Yeah, well, from, from the metaphysical perspective, you know, we've had certain knowledge and wisdom and understanding for a long time, you know, thousands of years, some of it. And yet today it's resurfacing, I would say, because science is finally coming back around. Uh, meaning that at one point in time, science and metaphysics uh, were one thing. You know, they were like science emerged out of alchemy, hermetic sciences and so forth. And so they were one thing. They weren't separate during those times. And it was only after uh, the Newtonian era and the scientific revolution that they, the scientists decided to kind of pull away from the spiritual side of it, leave that to the church, leave that to religion and their department, and let's just go into the material side of things that we can prove physically. And, you know, it's all, there's, there's a mechanical, logical, clockwork kind of way of, of describing the universe. And so then that kicked off the whole industrial revolution that became so successful that those principles were then applied into so many areas of life. And then, um, you know, and that was for several hundred years that, that, you know, industrial Newtonian kind of age is kicking off. And then now, since about the early 1900s, we are back into, you know, all of that Newtonianism was turned on its head with the quantum revolution. And with quantum mechanics and quantum physics, all of a sudden it opened up the door again for consciousness and our participation and um, things not making so much logical sense according to our classical view of the world, but seeing that there is a deeper reality underneath that classical reality that reveals things that are according to the same principles that many ancient spiritual teachings and, and wisdom were trying to say. Uh, so they're coming back together and you know, some, some scientists would say, no, no, that's just pseudoscience and they, you know, there is no spiritual side and they would tr try to, you know, wave it away. And they, they do a lot of, um, they put a lot of effort into discrediting it. But the more science continues forward, the more we discover, the more it continues to point to many of these ancient wisdom teachings. And there are a number of scientists and um, also metaphysicians who are trying, are starting to kind of merge in their paths to realizing, okay, now consciousness is primary. And where does that consciousness come from? You know, that's, that's one of the big questions. And there's two camps, you know, is it from our spirits? Is it, is it prior to the physical or is it because of the physical? Is it an emergent phenomenon? And, um, you know, when you really look at all the evidence, it seems like it's primary. And Absolutely. so this is where spirituality comes. 
it's fascinating. I mean, there's, there's two things I want to say to that to really kind of to, to really bolster that and, and lay some foundations down. Um, the first one is that everything you just said is literally backed up by scientific experiments and repeated experiments. So one of the things there that you can look into things like the, um, um, the, the what's, what's it called? The split, the split hole experiment. Yeah. 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 The double slit, sorry, the double slit hole. <laughs> um, so that proves that the, um, the observation, the observer can impact the results of the experiment. And the, you, know, you can look into that if you want, but the point is, is that that's consciousness impacting the material world and that's been proven. Um, yeah. So this very much is in the realm of science. It's just that it's putting consciousness into the equation, sometimes consciousness first. Um, and then just on a common sense point of view, I think that um, you know, it, it's, it's more, there's a common parlance now to talk about one's ego, right? And when I say someone's ego, we're not talking about um, so whether someone's egotistical and arrogant. I'm talking about whether they're in the mind, in the psyche and all this stuff. And what can happen is that if you haven't done so much personal development, um, you can literally think that everything you think and feel is you, right? So one of the big transformational shifts for me around eight years ago now, when I really started getting into this, was a course that I went on and they said, um, the voice in your head is not you. And then all of a sudden, that was a moment where I shifted to going, oh, wait a minute, I can literally observe my thoughts. I can observe my feelings. So if I can be the observer, then wait a minute, who's the observer, right? So that, that's where the consciousness thing comes in as well, right? So right. Yeah. it's about, first of all, liberating yourself to that level of understanding. And then once you've liberated that, then you can sort of realize yeah. that, oh, um, there must be something there, right? It doesn't matter what your religious or spiritual beliefs are. It's just a fact that you can admit that, that there's, an, there's an observer there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the observer and, and it, you know, we used to call it also the witness perspective, you know, sure. we kind of step into this almost like third person observing ourselves, witnessing ourselves, realizing, oh, those thoughts in my head, that is a, that's the program, you know, that's from our indoctrination. That's from our, you know, maybe our life experiences, but we've developed belief systems around those things. And that voice is it's personality. It's not, re or ego, you know, it's not really, who we really are. It's not the mm. essential I. And so that is that witness self or that observer from a the higher perspective is more the essential I without all the masks and indoctrination. It's just pure awareness mm. and then pure ability to consciously observe, right? And I think the word indoctrination is actually quite appropriate because um look, you know, that that could stir up a, a, an emotional response because indoctrination, what's going on? I'm not being indoctrinated. <laughs> But, but the, the truth is, is that Newtonian physics, which is the basis of materialism and not quantum physics, right? Um, that is basically what's still very much taught in educational systems. We're not talking about quantum physics still in education environments. You know, it's kind of when you get to an adult um, perspective and you listen to a fabulous podcast like this, where you go, what's this quantum physics thing? Um, <laughs> and, and, but you can look into it. So, so yes, we have... Um, you know, indoctrination is appropriate because of educational systems still teaching Newtonian materialistic physics. It's also appropriate because there's this relationship between the subconscious mind and the conscious mind. Exactly. And, and so, so what kind of comes over into the thought space, you know, remember, it's just coming from your subconscious a lot of the time. Um, and you can observe it. And it's, just because it's in your head doesn't mean that it has to be you or has to be your choice. Right. Yeah. And, and, and this, you know, we could say the subconscious is also the old brain, right? So our, in we, in growing up, we went from infancy to adulthood and the brain is growing during that time. It's wiring during that time. There's certain patterning and stimulus that we're being exposed to during that time. And that is establishing the foundations of the brain, mm -hmm. which then establishes the foundations of the subconscious. And it's only when we're in our teens to early twenties that we start really developing the cortex and the prefrontal cortex where we have any real control over the decisions we make. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, what we, what we're really conscious of is that tip of the iceberg compared to what's really going on in oh. the deeper aspects of our oh, psyche oh, oh yeah oh yeah i mean i i laugh and i'm also terrified by that as a parent because i hear myself all of a sudden saying to the kids you know you're almost like you just you repeat what your parents did to you right and, it, and you know and that and that could be the most simple beautiful things that were just part of your upbringing you know i could almost hear myself saying if you don't start screaming in the back of the car now i'm gonna pull this car over and it's literally <laughs> what your parents said you know it's it, it's it's just a repeating and you, I really noticed that repeating of 
that subconscious conditioning through my parent yeah. journey and it's great because i think that's what conscious parenting yeah. is about right conscious parenting is literally saying oh wait a minute this is kicking in again is this actually what i choose now to pass to the next generation right yeah because the words we say really matter and the words we say also really reveal that deeper subconscious belief even if we didn't realize oh do i still believe that <laughs> yeah yeah. And then, you know, and then with the, even with our society, we have a subconscious, right? We have a patterning, yeah. as you were saying, like with that Newtonian mindset and that that is still what we teach. Even, even for me, all the way into graduate school, it was still, physics was still primarily classical physics first, Newtonian mindset first, you know, program it in, think that way. And then only later do we then try to bring in the quantum physics, but it's a completely different way of thinking. Mm. And so they're trying to build a quantum awareness on top of a classical way of thinking. And it doesn't really work that way. Mm. We need to shift into quantum principles first and then later see how it statistically averages out to classical principles. But it's, you know, it's the quantum that is the, the true way that we should be thinking and orienting our perceptions in the world. And, and that changes our whole approach to, to life and who we are and what we can accomplish. And, you know, so much that then bridges back into the metaphysics and the practices of, you know, intention and, and the power of our will and uh, why we should focus and train the mind, why we should meditate and achieve coherent states. Like all of these things tie into quantum physics. They do, they do. And I think this is one of the things that, this is, comes down to openness now as a subject for me because I think spirituality or these types of subject matters, um, I treat it to a, an experience. So like, for example, I'd never been in really just a spirituality thing until I had a wonderful healer all of a sudden and I became open to it and I went to have my first blessing. And in that moment, and, and all of a sudden I'm in this room, I have no idea what's going on. It's all good. There's nothing dodgy about it. And there's a healer and she puts a thumb on my forehead and like, boom, it's like the world just exploded. And yeah. so in that moment, I witnessed something, I experienced something. So that was a spiritual experience. Now, the reason I mentioned that is that what that means to me is that I now have the evidence in my life that this type of stuff exists. Yeah. But you see, that's also the trap, isn't it? Because we are human beings experience time most of the time in linear perspective and there and also in a causal effect perspective because you know we can't we can't avoid the fact that if we fall over and break our arm it hurts so we live in a physical world so cause and effect linearity all this stuff is very real um for us because we feel it we see it um so, so my point is to, to make this relevant here is that i found your comment there very interesting Quantum is where you start, and then statistically, on average, it may seemingly manifest in the in the Newtonian realm of like, oh, sure, on average, this is why seemingly it's the Newtonian way. Um, so, how do we, you know, again, beyond kind of open-minded conversations like this, how do we start opening up um, our hearts and minds to this? Because it's very easy. What I'm alluding to here is it's very easy to stay stuck in this particular perspective trap, and it, by staying stuck in that you can't even see that this world exists. How do you break through that? Yeah, that, and that's, I mean, that's key number one is belief, right? So often in the past, we've said seeing is believing, and that's become a motto of the Newtonian mindset that I have to see it, taste it, touch it, feel it, smell it, in order to believe that it's real, right? Meaning it has to be material for me to put any credibility to it. And so that seeing is believing mentality has really um, put the blinders on us because, you know, it's like it's got to prove itself to us first before we believe in it. But when it comes to the spiritual realms and, you know, things like magic and, and blessings and, you know, all this kind of stuff, it's actually the opposite that believing is seeing. Because now we're moving beyond the material realm and the, what you see is what you get kind of realm to all these subtle energies. And our mind, um, you know, we take in a certain amount of information and our brain processes that but it does a very sort of general picture of what we're perceiving, what stimulus is coming in. It does a general picture. And then it fills in the gaps based on our beliefs, expectations, and assumptions. And so when we have a belief or expectation that there's not a, a spiritual or subtle realm or anything more than what we're 
you know, what we think we're perceiving going on, then we block ourselves from actually seeing it. So key number one is belief Like we have to open ourselves up to the idea that there's more going on than what I currently perceive and maybe even think of as real. So just being willing to be open. And then number two, as you experienced, was um, having a direct experience, you know, and as we have these direct experiences, it's like, okay, well, I maybe, I'm not sure I can explain it, but I felt it and I know it was real. And that makes me say that, okay, there's something there, there's something more. And in time, maybe we'll come to understand it and maybe we'll be able to even measure it scientifically, who knows, but, um, but at least I know that there's a real experiential thing and I didn't make it up with my mind, you know, like yes, sometimes yes. when things happen to us and we're not expecting anything and yet something happens, it's like, whoa, I would never have made that up. And yet I can't deny that it happened. Right. So, so belief and then experience, but in order to experience, we have to have a willingness to yes. be open yes. And, and participatory. You know, I used to call it, um, actually a friend coined, you know, shared the term with me, being a participating skeptic. And I think that's healthy because we're open. I'm going to participate. I'm going to see what's here. I'm not going to make a decision one way or another, whether it's real until I experience it. And then it, through my experience of it, it can, you know, I can assess and then I can see if, if there really is something there or not. I'm not going to make there be something and just have it be a psychological process, right? Because that's just, you know, that's placebo effect, basically. Um, but I'm not going to close my mind to the possibility either, right? So yes, we'll be skeptical, meaning discerning. We can be discerning, mm. but not like a, like a cynic. We're not going to be cynical about it. Yeah. And that's, that's the key, you know? Yeah, and then the other thing with experience, just one final thing with experience is realizing that the subtleties are real too. Just because, you know, in our Western society, especially, we tend to be like, everything has to be so intense. And I mean, you just look at the movies and how much stimulus we have to be bombarded with anymore to be entertained. It's like, it has to be so like intense and in your face all the time. And in that process, we miss the subtleties. And in that missing of the subtleties, it's like we're the subtleties are the bridge into the spiritual realm. And so when we can tune into those subtleties and allow those to be real, even though they're subtle, now we can start to shift our way into that uh, bigger experience. Like we follow it and it opens the door. Absolutely. Like on the subtle thing, for example, um, when I was seeing this healing lady, lovely, amazing woman, um, she would do work on my chakras, right? So as, as part of me building my business, she would then see what's going on at a chakra level. And you've got seven main chakras and there are more. One of them is the throat chakra. And so, for example, in that subtle awareness, we had a session and she goes, okay, there's some rustiness going on here. You're anxious about the message um, that you wanted to give and, and also how you're going to do this, which is what partly what that chakra is about. And only by willing and going there and you know, being in a meditative state and allow her to clear it out, you could, you could actually feel that. And she was shifting it, you know, so, so again, it's the subtleness because, you know, so that's one thing. And then also remember that our current day society is very, um, as you say, stimulated and that's certain types of brain waves too. So like, for example, alpha brain waves, I believe are the ones that are the awakening alert state. Gamma beta. is when you're sleeping, right? Is that beta mm -hmm. or alpha? Which one is it? Beta is, beta is awake. Gamma is like hyper, uh, like, conscious and connected but yeah. it's a whole state and but we're alert whereas alpha you start getting relaxed theta you start to sorry it's alpha's relaxed okay yeah and then delta is like super deep sleep right so we've got all these different things right then the, and there's different states of consciousness and there's also theta right and i believe theta is the one that's the imagination and the creative process so like um i'm sure the audience can relate to this have you ever had a great idea in the shower yeah <laughs> Right? And it's because you're in a relaxed state and you're allowing your brain to get into theta. Also, when you go to sleep and it's that time between conscious awakeness and going to sleep, theta can kick in and that's why you have an inspiration. So like I had an inspiration for my, for my first book as I'm going into that, which I'm currently writing. Um, and um, yeah, and that was cool. And it came to me, boom, all of a sudden, just before I go to sleep. So, mm -hmm. so again, like I think there's a link here, isn't there? Because you've got, it's that awareness and the willingness to say subtle stuff exists. Um, and guess what? We, we kind of have these different mechanics going on. So you might be in this hyperactive alert modern day looking at Facebook and phone state. That's not the state in which you're going to be willing to witness subtle things because you're so bombarded 
<laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. And, and in order to actually connect to more higher states of consciousness, we do need to drop our brainwave frequencies into the alpha, theta, delta in order to stop being so focused on the outer stimulus and start being more focused on the inner stimulus, the inner sensations coming in. And this is stuff that I get into in the second half of season two of mystery teachings. Like I go into the brain, how each area works, what, what exercises, what stimuli, what sensory inputs, you know, can help us rewire all of this stuff so that we can access more of our consciousness. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Oh my gosh. I love it. It gives me goosebumps. And again, let me create another ladder because what this conversation, right? For some people listening to this, they're like, they're already there with us and like, yeah, this is brilliant. Love it. Tell me more. And for some people there'll be a little bit of skepticism and that's great. Be healthy skeptic. So let me create an additional little bridge to what one of the things you said, which was, um, you have to believe it in order to see it. So in psychology and brain science, I think there's, there's something called the reticular activating system. And, um, you know, people like Tony Roms will mention it. I use it in my seminars. And the point is, is that the reticular activating system spots what you're focusing on. So if you, um, so for example, I bought a white Camry hybrid. As soon as I bought the white Camry, all I saw was Camrys and white Camrys on the road. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so it's an example of literally, because you're believing that that's something you're focusing on is in your life, is what you see. Um, so you can actually prove this at that type of level. So you literally won't tune in to things that you don't believe in that are even possible. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, that's true. I actually experienced a similar thing. I, just, I had bought a brand new, uh, you know, the new Honda Civic. And then all of a sudden, everywhere I was seeing that same one, I'm like, I, th I thought I was the first and I wasn't seeing it until I was on the, you know, car lot. And then all of a sudden it was everywhere. <laughs> So yeah, that's, that's a very interesting thing. And it, it kind of ties into the, you know, the power of intention that what we're focusing on and what we really bring our whole being into resonance with, it's, it starts to show up more in our life. Is it because now we're only just seeing it or is it because we're attracting it to us? Because that's the resonance that we're putting out exactly. there. Exactly. Yeah. So there's an openness to that. And also like the, the, the word decide, I think has got, um, it's got some, uh, some origins to the word, and I think it's related around to kill off. So literally to kill off an option of what you're not doing, right? So again, there's like, there's, there's, there's personal power in that, there's intention, there's the universe. And let me round off this opening, these opening conversations, because I want to move on to another thing, which is that all of this stuff in the Newtonian realm is about separation, cause and effect. So if I take a ball here and I knock it against this ball, the boink, it will move over here. So what we're alluding to here, can you see how just having a good conversation, we can see that there's dots everywhere and it's not hard to connect the dots. And that's the approach that I take. Just connect the dots and you'll see that it's all bloody related. So it's naive and ignorant to think that it's not connected. And, and I, I use the word ignorant purposely here because think about the word. If you ignore, if you are ignorant, you are, I am ignoring so mm -hmm. ignorance is down to the personal responsibility of the person that's refusing to say, no, 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 no. What Chris is saying makes sense, but I'm going to ignore it. You're literally being, sorry to say it, but you're being, that's what ignorance is, right? I'm right. choosing, willfully choosing ignoring. Choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're willfully, you know, shutting something out of our awareness, right? Mm -hmm. We're ignoring it. And, you know, when, when you look at the, just the pure science, mm -hmm. The amount that we actually perceive with our five physical senses is literally 1% of the physical universe around us. And this is scientifically verified. I mean, the, the amount of, of what we can see of the electromagnetic spectrum is just a, a tiny sliver. The amount of what we hear, the amount of what we smell, taste, touch, all of these things are such a small section of the whole spectrum of physical reality around us. So if we think that, you know, we know what reality is based on what we experience with our five physical senses, we're fooling ourselves because that's just one percent. And so, you know, science is giving us a, a vision into some of the broader reality through these detectors and other ways of observing the physical reality, but still that's just physical reality. There's, there's frequency levels beyond what our scientific detectors can reach so far. And there's way, way, way more going on. And, and I would say, ultimately, what we call spiritual, it's, it's the same. It's all energy as well. And it's the same spectrum. It's just at frequency levels that are way beyond anything we can physically detect at this time. And so it's, it, it, at some point in the future, we will have more and more sensitive detectors. We'll be able to reach more into those ranges to verify. But that's just, all science really does, I, I think, um, 
is it verifies what, what metaphysicians have been able to sort of divine or, or have this gnosis, you know, this mystical direct consciousness experience of, and then they try to convey it in whatever language they have available to them. And then science is now coming around and, you know, verifying what the mystics have known for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. But then science also takes it and says, okay, now how can we apply it and harness it for technology? Mm -hmm. Right. And so then we, you know, we, we get our smartphones and our various gadgets and things that we, you know, 3D printing, like all these things that we can make useful out of it. Mm -hmm. But it's it, like we have the opportunity through consciousness to reach into these bigger uh, levels of awareness, even if our five physical senses are still attuned to just a small sliver of, of the, the pie. Spot on, spot on. Now you mentioned frequency there, and that's the perfect segue to the questions I want to ask around vibration. Now you may or may not be aware, and I'm not talking to you now, I'm talking to the audience. You may not, may not be aware <laughs> that a rock is actually just a low vibration, right? So everything in the physical universe has a vibratory frequency. So the idea is that a rock or a physical object like that is just a dense vibration. Now, on a higher vibration, you've got another physical object like a wine glass. And it's literally true that if you sing into the wine glass at the right frequency, you can smash that wine glass. And the principle there is um, vibratory resonance. So the point is, is that when you match something in the physical realm with the same frequency, it can cause it to, to disrupt, right? So... So we know that that exists, that's proven. Here's the thing, in this arena, these types of worlds that you and I live in, in all sorts of you know, metaphysics, new age, uh, just, just this raising of awareness, right? It's a very, 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 very common phrase to say, raise one's vibration. We must raise our consciousness. Now, why is it assumed that raising is always better? Okay, so my perspective on that is that, you know, we have two different things here we're talking about. We have, we have physical, you know, materia, and there's a different, you know, vibrational levels that things manifest at. And then there's consciousness itself. And they're, they're, they might have the original same substance or essence, but they've manifested in different capacities. So there's two different spectra that we're talking about. And consciousness um, when it's a lower vibration, it's going to be more focused on the physical, right? So more dense material levels. As we raise the vibration to higher frequencies, like, you know, just like if you think of the visible light spectrum, you, you know, the slow frequencies are red and the high frequencies are purple and ultraviolet and so forth. So as we raise up the spectrum into these higher frequency levels, we are now starting to reach into levels beyond just physicality and into higher spiritual planes and what i think of though is not so much about frequency as much as it's about expansion so we're we're shifting you know we can call it dimensions but don't think of it like spatial dimensions uh, it's more like levels of density or frequency levels and as we go to these higher frequencies or dimensions we can perceive more of the full spectrum, right? Rather than just being tuned in only to that higher frequency, we can, we can perceive this and this. Kind of like if you think of, um, you know, there's an ant and it's walking along a surface and on that surface, it thinks everything is two dimensional. But then as we go to the higher dimensional view, we can see, oh no, it's walking on a ball, it's three dimensional. Right? But it, from the ant's perspective, it looks two-dimensional. So we can see, we can look up really close and see it's two-dimensional, but we can also look further away and we can see it's three-dimensional. Right? So we just get a more all-encompassing view as we expand our consciousness. Right. That's a really nice answer. I like that because the, and by the way, there's a wonderful YouTube video. I think if you Google something like the 10 dimensions of um, 10 dimensions or something, it's like a, it's a physicist that goes into explaining examples yeah. like that, where you can see the answers like this, but then all of a sudden you can see it from above and, and it literally proves how there are only a certain number of dimensions possibly in the universe, perhaps. Um, but that's the point, um, being able to take a higher dimensional viewpoint. So I like that. Okay, there's an, uh, that creates a nice association in my mind about when we talk about raising consciousness, it's about accessing these higher dimensions so that you can get you know, a better, well-rounded perspective of what's going on in your physical life, shall we say. Um, yeah. There is another thing I would like to, if we can just like come out of the ether now and jump back down to the physicality for a second. I, I do want to ask something because um, 
Like in music, for example, you've got um, 440 hertz, which is the note A. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look up the history to this, um, I think in the American Music Association or something in maybe the early 20th century, there was a time where they literally changed and what was called the natural A, which composers you know, and orchestras used around the world. And that was, I think, 432 hertz, right? right. And they changed right. it to 440. Now, there's all sorts of theories on that. Uh, but that I want to, you know, I want to make some links here to, to the, let, I'm going to, I'm fully take on board your point about, you know, the, the higher dimensional raising consciousness is like a higher dimension thing. But when it comes to the physical realm, um, here's my question and, and distinction. Do we also need to be aware of modulation? So what I mean by that is that we can't, I, I don't think within this physical, physical realm that we can just assume that either going one direction or the other is by default good. I think it's also relevant to be in alignment with the right modulated types of frequency for our own physical well-being, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Like, what, what do you think about that? <laughs> yeah, you know, in the mystery school, we have a, a saying that says um, the purpose defines form and form defines purpose or form reveals purpose. And so, you know, the, what frequency we're working at is a particular, we could say it's a particular form. And that form or that level of operation, that modulation, let's say, has a purpose to it, right? There's a functionality to it. And so it's not about one being better than another, it's about what's the function and the task that we're trying to accomplish. And then based on that task or that purpose we're trying to accomplish, now we're gonna, we're gonna tune ourselves in to the proper frequency level to accomplish that at the best way. You know, and, and, and in, in metaphysics and spiritual traditions, you have, you have a similar concept where they talk about you know, like shamanic work, you know, like shamanic magic. And it's very much based on the earth and the four elements and the herbs. And, you know, it's very physically oriented. And then you have other things that are, you know, they go into angelic stuff and it's all celestial and it's, you know, it's operating at much higher frequencies. And, and it's, it's not so much about the body as much as it's about soaring, you know, your spirit soaring. So there's these different frequency levels or band, bandwidths that we might tune ourselves into to shift according to what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, so I, I think that the 432 hertz, um, I also like the solfeggio frequencies, like 528 hertz, and, and using some of these tuning scales as a, as a new way to shift what we're listening to you know what we're tuning into and how we're wired because those stimuli will shift our wiring in our body um you know when you listen to 432 versus 440 they're so close but you you know well-trained ear can tell the difference and you know there was also in ancient um musical tuning systems they used to use pythagorean tuning where every note on the scale was a perfect fifth you know it was a two-thirds or three-fifths um, kind of octave uh, or, or ratio up the octave. Mm -hmm. And that also has been changed by the standardization. And yet when you listen to Pythagorean tuning, it's just slightly off from our standardized tuning. But it, it, and it might sound a little off key until you tune yourself into it. It's fascinating. It's and like, you know, so you can, you can do two things here. You've got two rabbit holes you can dive down. You can either go dive down a conspiracy rabbit hole and ask why people are doing that, why that happened. Um, you know, I love a good rabbit hole. I'll dive down any good rabbit hole. Um, but rather than doing that, I'd rather stay in the kind of like proof area to kind of welcome people into these types of subjects. And, you know, if you, on, for example, on the 432 hertz thing, there's something called cymatics. And if you don't know what cymatics is, then it's literally about, um, I know you do, Teresa, but like for the audience, um, it's literally the, the, you put on the plate sand and you turn up the frequencies and it shows the physical um, shape that is you know, caused by that particular frequency. And the point is, is that at certain frequencies, there's a natural, elegant, beautiful pattern that emerges as a result of that specific frequency, which only bolsters and adds on in perfect alignment to what you just said at the beginning there, that every frequency has a purpose. So I think it's, again, fascinating how we bring this all together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the, you know, with, I mean, standardization is something that I think, I think they made the bad choice by going into a standardized, very arbitrary type of scale and system in music. Um, but it was based on logic. Right. I don't know that it was based on anything but science and logic. And this is what we're going to agree to. Uh, or maybe it was based on, you know, how they're going to tune their instruments and how, how what's the sort of standard 
that they're going to use for all musical tuning, right? You know, we could go into conspiracies. Oh, they're trying to control and dumb people down and, you know, who knows, but, <laughs> but we have this um, beauty that nature reflects to us all around. Right. And just by, and this is one of the things that science and, and alchemy of the past always did was they would observe nature and based on what nature was reflecting to us that, you know, revealed to us some of the universal principles and, and um, the, the laws that we want to be attuning ourselves into so that we can be aligned with it and, and in that flow of life rather than just, you know, a, a synthetic human system. Right? Exactly. So, I mean, speaking, speaking of um, universal principles, I'd like to ask you a question around um, hermetic principles. So um, for those of you that don't know what it is, I'll let you kind of go do that because I'm not going to cover every single one right now. But one of the hermetic principles is the principle of rhythm. So the idea there is that universally everything has an ebb and a flow just like the um the ocean comes in and out you know you can't escape physically around you also within your own life the idea that everything has a rhythm so in terms of the way that we can apply this hermetic principle of rhythm to our own personal lives how can how can we you know really tap into the power of that to have a more fulfilling life so there's a couple things. I mean, first of all, it's recognizing what is our rhythm. I mean, one, we have rhythms that are already entrained into certain biological and, you know, like lunar cycles, solar cycles, seasons, and so forth, day and night, right? So we have these rhythms. And in our art, the more artificial our world becomes, the more sort of out of tune we, we become because we, we use artificial light and we're, you know, pulling all nighters and, and these kinds of things. And we throw off our natural rhythm. Um, which then puts stress on the body and so forth. So the more we can pay attention to what those natural rhythms should be um, and, and then really try to create a, a, a regular a rhythm to life, so to speak, then it helps us to thrive. It helps us to you know, keep mo mo momentum going and so forth. But the principle of rhythm also is about what is my personal rhythm because not everybody operates the same way. There's no one size fits all. And that's a matter of know thyself. And, you know, in our world today, we tend to be very driven. We want to accomplish. We want to make things happen. We, we want to, you know, we have deadlines we got to meet, right? So we, we're very driven to produce and to be active. And in our overdrive of activity and our overdrive of stimulation, we tend to be lacking on the, the restfulness, right? The, uh, the waiting. It's okay when we're depleted. Maybe that's a, that's, a sign that we need to just take downtime, right? So real, the principle of rhythm says that as far as the pendulum swings to the left, it's going to also swing that far to the right. And so when, when we've been in a high active period, we have to realize that at some point, inevitably, the low is going to come. And rather than fighting the low, which most people tend to do in our world today, we need to work with it. We need to say, okay, now's, now's the ebb, meaning I need to take some rest so that I can recover and have a next, you know, be ready for the next flow time. Mm. But then, but then there's also how do we minimize the pendulum swing left or right, right? And so in, in a lot of the mystery teachings in Kabbalah, we're talking about living the middle pillar and living the middle pillar is that balance point where it's not swinging too much to the right or to the left. And we really learn to create our own rhythm by calling in certain energies and having certain practices that we do every day that sets the flow, that sets the rhythm. Uh, and that allows us to really ha harness and master our rhythm rather than being mastered by it. So those are a couple of things at a personal level. That's so spot on. And I, and I really relate to that. So like example, two examples would be if I do an all nighter, then the next day I'm nowhere near as productive because I've just burnt it too much. You know, I can't, I can't be as productive the next day. Um, yeah. another example would be, you know, the, the accomplishments of high of, you know, say you just been acknowledged to somewhere and it was a big thing and you worked so hard on it, you did a publication or whatever. And then afterwards, so ironically, you go, oh, what now? You know, like, you know, because you know, what was the, what's the meaning about? Um, yeah. yeah. And on the light thing too, that's so spot on. Like I make a point in the morning now of, um, not looking at my phone for the, the first hour at least. Um, mm. and I will purposely go out on the balcony um, I won't allow my son anymore to watch television in the morning and I go out on the balcony and watch the sunrise. And then I really do believe about sinking, you know, your, 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 your That's case. Really, really good practice. Mm -hmm. Very, very good. And, and then, and yeah, I mean the lights, the LEDs, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's so harsh on the eyes when you're just waking up or when you're trying to go to sleep. Like that's, 
you know, really damaging. And especially with the, um, the amount of saturation that they have in the color yep. of our devices, it's like overly saturated on purpose because it's trying to make your brain think it's candy. Uh, and so then we get addicted to it because it's so colorful, right? So yeah, I, I think it's really good to try and, you know, I actually put gray screen or grayscale on my, uh, my phone, for example, so that I don't see all the saturated colors and it, it makes a difference. You don't get as hooked on it. It's fascinating, and there's the, the yeah, there's also the, the blue uh, blue light goggles you can get now, and then all that stuff. And there's a guy that I want to get on the podcast, which is a is a doctor in this area. He's called Doctor Jack Cruz, and I, I just whoa, he just blew my mind. So like, watch this space. Well, after this one, we'll get him on. Now let, let's carry on the journey because um, that that's a lovely answer about rhythm. Um, the Kabbalah, I want to I want to go into that. Um, so the Kabbalah is something that you've got different types of Judaism, right? And there's um, there's his Hasidic Judaism. Um, and I believe that Kabbalah is sort of related to that. And it's, it's, it's a, it's basically from my understanding, it's a mystery school type of knowledge and arena of exploration that is, I understand linked to Judaism. So, but I'm very new to it. So, you know, people will, you'll hear Kabbalah, um, either referred to at depth through an expert like yourself. Um, some people will kind of dip their toe in the water and mention certain things from Kabbalah, but um, you know, without going into the detail of what all of the things that Kabbalah is, because that, that's just a lifelong journey. Um, can I ask a question? Like, is Kabbalah a religion? You know, is it is it is it Judaic? You know, what is it? What is Kabbalah, and is it religion? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so Kabbalah itself is not a religion. It's it's a mystical tradition, and uh, from my training in Kabbalah, it certainly there is a very strong tradition within the Hasidic Judaic, uh, you know, kind of thread or lineage of Kabbalah. There's a very strong tradition there. Um, but it's, it's not like most people who are Orthodox Jews, for example, don't study Kabbalah, right? It's, it's a mystical tradition. And to them, uh, a lot of times it was shunned upon just as much as something like Gnosticism was shunned upon by the Christians, um, or you know any kind of you know pagan types. Of, so it's it's most of these mystery traditions are were pushed out. You know they were made wrong by traditional religions, regardless of what religion we're talking about. Like the religions come in with a lot of dogma and and need to control and um, and you know be the mediator. Right, they're the mediator between people and their God or their enlightenment. Whereas the mystical traditions are about, no, you don't need any mediators. It's all inside of you. The keys are in you. And we just need to know how to awaken that ourselves. And so here's the tools, here's the teachings, here's the training so that you can awaken your own connection and you don't ever need a mediator. And therefore you don't ever need to give your power away because it's all inside of us. The divine is in us. Right. And so Kabbalah, itself actually has a very ancient tradition and it predates any particular religion. Mm -hmm. uh, so w with the tradition that I've studied in it, it's, it has nothing to do with any religion at all. Yeah. Um, it's more within the Western mystery school tradition. So we tie it, we've linked it into, you know, universal principles, hermetic teachings, alchemical teachings. Um, certainly there is the, the, the ways in which it's been informed by the Judaic tradition of Kabbalah, but Kabbalah itself is just, it's the study of life. It's, mm. it's, a, it's like an instruction manual for how to live life, how to make the most of it, how to manifest in this life, how to really understand who and what we are and the potential we're here for and, and why we're here and all these things. So it has nothing to do with religion or dogma or any particular uh, set of, of, you know, scriptures, so to speak, there's, it's just a universal system and the tree of life, which is the central sort of glyph. And it's not the only sacred geometry, but it's one of the central ones. The tree of life is found in nature. It's not something that humans devised. It is something that is universal. And so when, in the way I work with Kabbalah, it's a universal principle of, of how we apply this to the system of the tree of life, how it corresponds to ourselves, to creation, to our DNA, um, to how we manifest and all, all of these things. And we can take it outside of the context of any one religion. But because it predates religions, you see 
Kabbalah having come into, of course, a very strong Judaic thread. There's a Christian Kabbalah. There's Sufi Kabbalah. There's, you know, you can see the Tree of Life and references. I mean, there's the same kind of teachings are in um, Taoism. I mean, it's, it's, you can find the principles all over. Uh, regardless of the religious traditions, so. love it. Lovely, lovely distinctions there. So this is a this is a deep, deep rabbit hole that actually you know goes deeper than you could probably ever know. But I love the, I love the few distinctions as the universality. Um, so Kabbalah is similar to things like Hermetic traditions because it's universal. It doesn't matter whatever else is going on in life, you can't avoid it. You know, it's who you are as a human. It's what's going on at the nature level, etc. Um, and when you actually open your mind up to it and study this stuff, you can you can observe it, and that that's the beauty of it too. And you can transcend these different things in terms of progressing, uh, progressing, sorry, around this around the tree of life. Um, yeah. So you know, no, for people that, for, for people that are interested in that, I can only do one of the most effective things, which is point to your series on guy because it explains it so well. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. so um, so thank you for clarifying that. You know. Yeah. And, and in the mystery school, we have a we have an approach, you know. That, so the modern mystery school's approach is to learn about it by living it, right? So You're it's right. not just about book study and so forth. I mean, you can only learn so much about Kabbalah through a book, or even even through, you know, there's certain deep teachings and concepts of Kabbalah that I give in the Gaia series. Uh, but ultimately, the only way to learn Kabbalah is to with direct you know, hands-on experience because it's about you. It's about your life. It's about your DNA, your blueprints. And you can only really learn that by living it and by awakening it. So we do, we do immersion trainings with people right. where they come and they, you know, really immerse themselves into this process of what we call ascending the tree of life. Mm -hmm. And then it's an experiential process. It's like it teaches us through our life in a very powerful way. Very cool. And it's like yoga, right? You only experience that beautiful experience of yoga by getting on that mat. You have to get on the metaphorical mat um, to do this. Yeah, um, yeah. So now nice. we follow the yoga of the West. Ooh, so the Western I like that. I'll have yeah, to get it. It's not about it's not about asanas. I mean, you you could come up with asanas. Oh, I get it. I get it. But you know, but, but, but it's just it's more like the um the moral of the story, should we say? Um, it's about and it's practicing. ultimately about union, you know, which is similar. It is. Right? Union yeah. with ourself, union with the divine. I, I believe that um, to yoke means it is about union. Uh, so the yoking of yoga. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, it's brilliant. Um, okay. So and another thing that, you know, you said that I think is really interesting is that um, I kind of just know this within myself. And when people have said it, it, like, it just resonates like gong. When people say that divinity, or God, or whatever you want to call it, it doesn't matter. Divinity is within you. That's one thing that just resonates with me. And the second thing is sovereignty and the mm -hmm. idea that we are sovereign beings and that if people invade in our sovereignty, we have a right to say, no, this is my life. This is my experience. Um, so that is something that is taught in religion. It is part of the Judaic um, Christian uh, religious practice. But the difference is, and this is what you said, which is perfect. Mystery school teachings are saying we don't need the practice of, say, for example, going to church in order to, in order to commune. And I use the words, you know, not provocatively, I mean them literally to commune with that inner thing in you, which is like, I have this divinity within me and I can commune directly with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, so ultimately we, we are the temple, right? And the temple is meant to be the inner temple and many of the outer expressions of a temple, you know, whether it's a church or, you know, synagogue or whatever, uh, that is a, that is meant to be, uh, or the original art and science of building those temples was meant to be as a reminder, you know, in stone that the temple is man. I mean, most of those temples uh, since at least 2000 onwards, but even in ancient Egypt, those temples were built upon the, the body of man, right? So they were, that was like the, the proportions, the, the style, the layout, everything was meant to be according to reminding man, human of their divinity. And um, so ultimately, the mystical traditions are all about cultivating that inner temple. And as you say, that inner communion, we don't need to go to the priest or the shaman to mediate for us if we can cultivate it within. Now, of course, we can always choose to, well, I don't want to do the work, so I'm going to go to somebody else. But that's giving our power away. So in, in our approach to in the Western mystery school tradition, we don't want you to give your power away. We want you to reclaim your power. We want you to recognize your own sovereignty, your own divinity. And in, in Kabbalah, we talk about wearing our crown. You know, that the, the top, very top of the tree of life is called the crown. 
and that we are on a journey of, of ascending the tree to reclaim our crown, which is our birthright, that we were meant to be sovereign. We were meant to be like a king or queen in our life and to live in this world in a way where we are, we are sovereign leaders and stewards of this garden rather than just always at the effect of everything outside of us. Mm. And so we have sovereignty from the perspective of, you know, whether we give our power away to others or whether others invade upon us, but we also have sovereignty within ourselves and taking that responsibility and being the one who's really truly the captain of our ship. No, oh, it just resonates with me so much. I love it. That's literally why I created an organization called Be What You Want to give people that personal power to reclaim it because I couldn't agree more. You just right. you give it away. That is not the answer. Um, right. It's looking, there's a problem in the human subconscious psyche, which is looking toward a savior to fix my problem when we can fix it ourselves. Yeah, exactly. And that, that savior complex is... <laughs> It is because of a lack of willingness to take accountability, responsibility for the fact that I have the power to make a difference. Right? Yeah. It's almost like people, uh, people are almost addicted to victimhood and, yeah. and being powerless. And so they continue to give their power away rather than claim the power. Well, so for any listeners out there, I, I, I mean this so from my heart, and I'm sure, Teresa, you feel the same. We bring these things up in conversation, not to push people away, but to call them towards, hey, a reclaiming of personal power and sovereignty. Right. Yeah, because there's hope. You know, there's hope that things can get better um, and that, that we really can make a difference in our lives, that we have the power within, but, but it starts with us claiming it, right? It starts with us saying, okay, it is within me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, why is all this stuff so hidden? It's interesting because, um, you know, when we talk about mystery schools, it's interesting, right? Because um, mm-hmm. I watched a fascinating documentary and he talked about uh, when something is in the past far away enough, right? You can have, um, I, think the, I think the phrase was, it can be a myth that then turns into legend. And then, you know, if it's, it's close enough to our timeline, then it can be a historical fact. But when it kind of, you know, goes further away further away further away it can be a legend of the past and then eventually becomes myth and people are like well it's not a fact is it because it's a myth um so like you know just just to illuminate around that subject for a second you've got the um the phrase is esoteric um and you've also got the phrase occult right now now this is um you know occulted knowledge um if i was to say the word the occult i know what a lot of people would think of they would think of devil worship and all the all these dark forces and stuff like that that's certainly how my impression of the world was when i would hear the occult um and i think in i'm not going to name religions but i think a lot of certain religions do sort of kind of use that phrase like it's just an automatic bad thing but i want to ask you some questions around this but just for the benefit of the audience let me unpack this for a second um when we use phrases like the occult, well, actually, we need to understand what the roots are in Latin. Um, so occultus means actually hidden secret, right? And in fact, the, the root of the word occultus is the oculus, and that is Latin for the eye. So an oculist, and for people that are old enough, they'll be able to remember this, an oculist was a eye doctor. So rather than going to the optem- optometrist, you would go to the oculist. So it's a phrase that we've used. It's just it's come out of, of usage um, so actually, you know, when we talk about the word um, the occult, all it means is hidden from the eyes. It doesn't mean by default negative, you know, devil worshipping, satanic things and all that stuff. And sure, there might be some of those practices out there. But, but you know, how do we disarm? Here's my question for you, and I'd love to hear the answer on this. How do we disarm and demystify terms such as the occult and esoteric so that people can benefit from its wisdom? Yeah, so as you said very well, it is it is very much about hidden knowledge. And why is it hidden from us? Well, I would say, you know, just as we were talking about before, that there's so much going on in the, the greater reality that is beyond what our five senses can perceive. And so it's hidden from us, like it's on the other side of, of this sort of veil. And so the occult in, and the esoteric studies are about trying to pierce that veil and see beyond what's just physically right in front of us. And, um, and it's, so it's hidden, not because it's trying to be kept away from us, but because it's just sort of beyond our normal way of perceiving things. And, um, and then there's a mystery, you know, there's mysteries to life, right? So why are we here? What are, what are we made of? You know, how, how is it that, we, what is the potential that we have within us, right? So there's all these mysteries to life. And those mysteries are what we study in mystery schools. 
you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's called a mystery school because it's a mystery and it's hidden and, you know, but it's not that. It's that we actually study the mysteries of life. And those mysteries of life are what, as we, as we venture into that, as we ask those questions like, who am I? Why am I here? What is the meaning of all of this? What, what is the potential of humanity, right? As we ask these questions, it causes us to search for the answers. And as we search for the answers, that puts us on the journey of transformation and expanding our consciousness and, and realizing the potential that is within us. So, you know, to me, esoteric and, and occult just mean, you know, it's, it's what's a little bit beyond your ordinary mundane consensual reality. And when we want to start to explore into the extraordinary, uh, then we're going to start piercing that veil and getting into the hidden worlds and, and you know, higher realms and deeper teachings. And there is a, there is a tradition, you know, within the mystery school tradition, there's, there's this study of um, what they call the underground river, you know, and, and there's times where this river, this source of water, is flowing and it's on the surface and everybody can partake of its, you know, clean and pristine water, let's say. And then there's other times where the river goes underground, right? And it's being protected and preserved and kept pristine because maybe there's too much pollution or maybe it's just not like the right environment for it to be out in the open. And so it goes underground and it submerges. And then at some point it comes up and it surfaces again. And this underground river is the mystery teachings, you know, that, that throughout time we've had this wisdom. It's never gone away. It's just there have been times where it's been on the surface for everybody to partake of. And then there's other times where it's been submerged and just being kept in a uh, protected and pristine environment waiting for the new time to come when it can resurface. And usually those times where it resurfaces, it's going to be like a golden age, a renaissance, an age of enlightenment. Today, um, you know, these things are surfacing again. And the times where it goes underground, it's because we had an inquisition, we had witch hunts, we had dark ages, you know, that there was a suppression of people having their sovereignty or people having the knowledge and the tools. And so, you know, we're really fortunate to live at a time where this, this, you know, river of wisdom has surfaced again, where the mystery schools that have always been there have come out into the open again for us to all partake of their, you know, what they have to offer. Wow. Thank you. Because that actually just caused a really important personal breakthrough for me in terms of recognizing it's the piercing of the veil. And it doesn't have to mean that those people that are into these things have an agenda not to share it with you is that literally the subject matter is about piercing the veil into the mysterious. Um, yeah. yeah. And there's a, there's a reason for protecting it because some people, yeah. you know, we have to be ready to pierce the veil. Right. And if we pierce the veil before we're ready, we don't know how to make sense of it. We don't know how to hmm. integrate it into our life. It might destabilize actually. Right. So there's a certain preparation we have to go through to be ready to really pierce the veil and see that greater reality because it really does challenge your belief systems um i mean i know for myself as i was well indoctrinated into the scientific way of thinking and this is what is and this is what isn't uh and then as i started getting into the mystery school teachings and and you know being exposed to some of these other concepts some of it really resonated and others like wait a second you know and, and are we just in fantasy realm here or are we in reality here and and it caused me to really question um but I, so i had to grapple with my belief systems and i had to grapple with you know what's what's um what's ultimately going to produce the best fruits you know, the best results in our life. And that's a good way to discern is by the fruits, you know, by the results it creates. And I started to see that the more I explored into the occult or the esoteric or the mystery school teachings, the more my creativity was waking up. Whereas when I was just in my science studies, it was kind of snuffing out my creativity mm -hmm. and the innovation. So the, this work really opens up our, our mind to be able to, to truly tap into new ideas and innovation and creativity rather than just regurgitating old knowledge and only working according to the old system. Absolutely. And, and also, if I want to make a little reference to um, whilst there may be no agenda not to be able to see this stuff, you know, at the same time, because it's about tapping into your divinity and your sovereignty by definition it would be naive not to admit that this makes you less controllable and um, without be by controllable in terms of like a relationship with a friend a family member um your boss your work an institution around you or even a nation you know it, it, it is kind of true 
So, um, you know, don't be ignorant of that. That probably is perhaps part of the reason why some of this has been tarnished with the incorrect brush um, to say like, oh, yeah, you can't get into that stuff because that's just not the way we do things. Um, so screw that um, is actually <laughs> something that we can reclaim because we have this within us and it is our birthright. And, you know, I, I very much, I fiercely feel that actually. Um, yeah. So, you know, that's wonderful. Um, now, look, I want to be respectful of your time. You've been so generous with your, with your heart and your energy and your intention today. Um, just in case people want to connect with the work that you're doing, um, either personally in the schools that you're interested in, um, give us all the plugs you want. You know, how can people connect with you? What's upcoming? Um, what's happening okay. on Gaia? What's happening in your life? What's on the, what's on the forefront of the horizon? Yeah, so so with Gaia, uh, if they want to check out the series on Gaia TV, it's uh, they can go to just mysteryteachings.com, and that'll give like some some teaser videos and some um, you know a, a little trailer and an idea of what's kind of contained in the series. So that's a really good thing. We just you know we season one's all out, season two is about to come out, and then there's going to be a season three at some point. So. Um, so there's mystery teachings and then my, my main body of work is actually with the modern mystery school. So I'm a, I'm an international instructor and I travel all around, um, the world and I help teach Kabbalah, I help, you know, do higher level initiation programs and so forth. So they can go to modernmysteryschool.com to check out some of that. It's actually a very international organization. We have centers all around the world. Um, and then, and then my personal website is TeresaBullard.com. And, you know, I've got lots of, I've always got projects going on. So, you know, next up is, is getting a book out there or another book out there and, uh, you know, next level training. So absolutely. absolutely. And for, for those that, you know, this is new, this stuff, I cannot recommend it enough to go to the mystery teachings on Gaia. Um, so that's wonderful, wonderful recommendation for all of those things. Dr. Teresa Bullard, it's been a I'll use my English phraseology here. It's been a bloody pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a, a really fun interview and just, you know, super good flow and natural conversation and yet really interesting topics that some people just don't think about. So thank Absolutely. you. You're welcome. You're welcome. We'll speak again. Absolutely.